Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, I want to say a big thank you for those of you who've been hanging on while we get through our technical difficulties. Um, my name is Andrea Russell, and we're here for a really amazing virtual talks at Google. I am honored and excited to be hosting Lama Rod Owens for a discussion about his new book, Love and Rage, The Path of Liberation Through Anger. Lama Rod Owens is a Buddhist minister, a social activist, a black gay man. Um, he also is the co-author of the best-selling book, Radical Dharma. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you all for having me. This is great, Andres. It's nice to be back with you in this space. Yeah, it's, it's so nice to have you. Um, and before we even dive into the book, I just wanted to start by just setting the stage and really anchoring us in some context, because I feel like your book could be more timely. Um, we started off this year with COVID-19 disproportionately killing black and brown Americans, mm -hmm. followed by, you know, the brutal murder murders of Breonna Taylor, mm -hmm. Tony McDade, George mm -hmm. Floyd, and countless others mm -hmm. um, by the police. And then over the past few weeks, we've seen protests, we've seen lots of statements, you know, lots of discussions and some actions. Mm -hmm. But to me, it sort of feels like companies, even Google, some institutions are really struggling to make meaningful changes and even defining what that change mm -hmm. should look like. Mm -hmm. um, so in your book, you talk a lot about addressing the reality of a situation, yeah. you know, walking with our feet on the ground. Um, and I think that's really relevant because conversations about racial inequity, police brutality and violence, they're super uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, so how do you think we can transform the spaces that we're in, whether that's a company like Google, an organization, our community spaces, um, without doing any individual work? Like how do we bridge that gap between the spaces that we're in and the individual work that, that we have to do? Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you um, for this question. Um, and, you know, before I begin, I just want to just take a moment just to honor and remember the lives of those we've lost this year. And, you know, you know, definitely to police brutality and violence, but also to COVID-19, you know, and all the lives we've lost, you know, this year. Um, I'm just holding that. Um, I think sometimes we hear these stories about folks passing and dying or getting killed. And it's like, oh, it's just another number. It's just like this person I read in the, in the news, you know, but um, you know, these people who are dying, these are people, you know, and in many cases it could have been us. You know? um, and that's why I always think when I hear about the death of someone, I say, ah, that could have been me. You know, and realistically, one day it will be me. I will die one day, you know. Um, but this is all really so intimately connected to the question because at some point you have to go into the personal in order to disrupt institutional violence. You know, if you want to change the institution, you have to change people. You know, um, and people don't change until they take the initiative to do the really important internal work, the inner work, you know, and that inner work for me is about learning how to look really deeply into my own mind. Um, it's about learning how to be with my body, you know, and to, to develop an intimacy with that, you know, I call it having an intimacy with the brokenheartedness and the brokenheartedness is just my pain, my suffering, my discomfort, you know, um, it's my bias, you know, it's my prejudice, it's the ways that I discriminate, it's, it's my ignorance, my lack of knowing, you know, about how I relate to the world, how I relate to people and systems, you know, um, until that work, um, is facilitated on the personal, then it's hard for institutions, companies, businesses, spaces to really begin to integrate um, a change that is disrupting these dominant narratives. You know, we talk about, for instance, Black Lives Matter, well, anti-Blackness is bred into um, what America is. 
So it's, it takes more than just a statement, you know, or a policy. It actually takes companies investing in the personal lives of its employees and to offer resources and support to do that, you know. Um, and that work doesn't happen over a year. It doesn't happen over a month. It doesn't, you know, it may not even happen over 10 years, but it's work that is a process. It's, it's a continuous process that we have to start at some point, you know. And I, I can't, I, I wouldn't be able to sit here and to have this conversation if it wasn't for almost 20 years of practice you know, 20 years of prim primarily meditation practice, you know, and sitting on a cushion and over and over and over and over again, bringing my mind back to the places in my experience that, that hurt, you know, the places in my experience that, um, that are the, 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 the foundation, the heart of the ways in which I create violence for people, you know? And when I use the word violence, it's not, you know, I'm not just talking about physical violence. And I think that's where we get confused. It's like we only think violence is physical. Violence is also um, can be offered emotionally and mentally. Violence happens anytime I do something that hurts myself or others. Anytime that I do something against someone's will is an act of violence. You know, and I have to name that for myself um, because if we're really committed to anti violence, you know, then we have to be committed to all the many ways that we create harm for ourselves and for others. Um, yeah, that, and, that's powerful. You know, I, I, I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of ways in which um, when violence comes up or, or we feel angry, we feel hurt, um, it doesn't feel like it's safe. You know, as a woman of color, yes. when when I feel like, especially at Google, you know, we, we have, have this idea of badge checking. So the intention uh -huh. is that we want to create a sense of security. We want to make sure that we know who's in the building. But in reality, it, it makes me feel like I don't belong. Yes. I had an experience in the New York office. I was in a common area. I wasn't even near the entrance. Um, and someone walks up to me, I'm chatting with a group of colleagues, and just asks me, to show my badge mm -hmm. um, and, and that felt violent to me and mm -hmm. I felt ashamed, I felt embarrassed. Um, mm -hmm. I think the people I were with also felt embarrassed on my behalf, mm -hmm. but it did, didn't feel like there's a, a space to share and talk about some of those microaggressions um, to create some of the repair because, mm -hmm. you know, there's often excuses, you know, they say that they mean well and these individuals might not even realize like that individual action mm -hmm. has an aggregate impact on me day after day someone asking me to validate my existence mm -hmm. at a company where i work mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well you know as, as i've often said like professionalism is often an expression of white supremacy you know and professionalism can become this way in which you know the values of white supremacy are um, imposed on an environment, but it's not called white supremacy, it's called professionalism. Professionalism is how we create space to be together in a way that limits the harm, you know, that we commit. But like the, 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 the essence of professionalism is in itself harmful, you know? Um, and so in those spaces for me, it's, you know, I know that professionalism is inherently anti-Black. You know, because there's no professional standards within a space that actually embraces blackness and how I was raised, you know? And I think a question that we can ask ourselves is like, okay, if I feel really comfortable in this space, therefore the space was created for me, <laughs> you know? You know, because some people thrive in professional environments and then that's, that's data. Okay, then why do I thrive? Oh, I wonder, if it's because you know these these professional boundaries, these professional guidelines actually are really expression of my life and my culture, and who and what I am, you know. And then maybe you go around and you ask people, okay, who are the ones who aren't so comfortable here? Who are the ones who are always being stopped at the door? 
you know, because that professionalism is an unconsciously calling for the, the policing of black and brown people, you know? Yeah, you know? And, and I think that's a, a great parallel to on the broader level, like the policing that we hear about in the news. Mm -hmm. We even had an example last year of, of quite a senior Googler who called the police, this is outside of work, on a black person who was waiting for a friend um, in their apartment building. Yeah, I remember and that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, you know, that kind of stuff makes me angry on his behalf. Mm -hmm. And it also makes me wonder, you talk about this a little bit in, in the book as well, in your conversation with Kate Johnson, yeah. the relationship of anti-blackness as a manifestation of white anger. Yes. And I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that and, and what the interplay is there, because often we focus on the black anger, but what is the, the white reaction? What's coming up there? Yeah, yeah, you know, and you know, and also to point out too that like when we talk about anti-blackness, you know, anti-blackness is a particular expression of racism that's particular to those of us who are of you know African descent or slave descent, you know, those of us who appear you know, to be black in a way, you know, and that particular prejudice that's actually expressed towards us is anti-blackness, you know? Um, anti-blackness, you know, um, as it relates to maybe the rage, you know, of white folks, you know, that, you know, for me, the rage, the anger of white folks really stems from um, the ways in which whiteness is a condition and a conditioning that's completely, um, that is actually just an expression of harm against black and brown people in general. You know, so whiteness in America was only created to disproportionately marginalize black people. You know, and then there's an unconscious knowing of that. And I think there's a lot of anger that comes out of that. Of course, the anger comes from the, the hurts. Like when you realize that like, oh, I'm white and conditioned to be white in opposition to blackness, you know? And what do I do to reconcile that? And knowing that there is a mountain of trauma that I have to turn back into to begin to reconcile that reality for myself, you know, that my whiteness is inherently an act of violence. I guess he gets black and brown people in this country, you know? And so of course, most of us don't wanna deal with that discomfort. So it actually turns into scapegoating. So black people get scapegoated for the discomfort that white people experience, you know? And that to an extent is just often how things happen. Like I, when I don't take responsibility for my own discomfort, my own pain, that I just blame someone else for it. And I just put the responsibility on them as if they're gonna fix it. You know, or as if I can erase them and my pain will go away. You know, if my pain goes away, my anger goes away, but that never happens. You know, as long as like that, the body that I've scapegoated this work onto remains that that person, that body continues to be a mirror. You know, it continues, it, it continues that that body continues to be a mirror for all of my unreconciled hurt and trauma. And so if there's no emotional labor for ourselves, then that violence continues against those bodies. Yeah. And I love the section in the book where you talk about this emotional labor mm -hmm. and the ways in which like, you know, often as black people, we're doing the emotional labor for ourselves as individuals, mm -hmm. for the community, especially in, in spaces like tech and larger yeah. companies where we're the only um, because it's a, a pretty serious burden. Yeah. Um, and how, how do we even acknowledge and reconcile that mm -hmm. in order to redistribute this mood? Yeah. Well, you have to disrupt the, the idea of professionalism, <laughs> you know, um, because that maintains the burden for black and brown people in spaces. You know, I have to do an incredible amount of emotional labor to repress 
these really important expressions of who and what I am, because if I were to express those things, then I would be disciplined in the space. So my emotional labor means that like I am spending a lot of time repressing these parts of myself, while others whom this, this professional space was created around actually begin to thrive. You know, so the space that opens up between myself who's repressing and others who are thriving, there's a space that opens up an intention in that space where I look at people and I'm just extremely angry <laughs> that they get to thrive, right? That I'm the one who stopped at the door and even being stopped at the door, being questioned about my right to be in a space is, you know, one of the more prominent types of emotional labor that we have to do in many spaces, you know, where we have to actually hold the space for really the, it, it is an expression of trans historical trauma, the trauma of being embodied in such a way in this culture where we're always being assaulted. You know, that we're always, we're always the recipient of some anti-blackness, of some type of racism, discrimination and so forth, just inherently because of the color of our skin, you know? And that means we're perpetually doing emotional labor, you know? Um, and so we have to be really, like we have to know that, you have to name that. I think black folks have to start naming that, that to be in the world means to be doing perpetual emotional labor, you know? Especially when people are trying to help, I'm still doing emotional labor because there are ways that people are trying to help me that are not skillful, you know? you know. And the thing I tell people all the time, the way that you're gonna help me is actually by doing your own work, of doing your own emotional labor for yourself. That's gonna help me tremendously. Yeah, I think that's so powerful because, you know, a lot of times, even I'll speak personally, I feel like I'm a co-lead for the New York BG and the Black Googler Network. And I feel like as an organization, we're doing a lot of emotional labor for the community. You know, my co-leads were phenomenal. The committee leads, all of the volunteers, they're, you know, it feels like we're holding up the community um, and Google to some extent without being recognized. And, yeah. and even that in and of itself feels hurtful. The fact that not only am I mad, but I have to tell you I'm I'm mad, tell you why I'm mad, and then tell you what you should be doing to help. Um, and I, I just wanted to acknowledge that because I know a lot of us, you know, working in tech, working even at Google feel that. And I really, it, it really meant a lot for me to read that in the book and, and hear you just outline that in a, in a really beautiful way. And I just really want to hold space for that, you know, for everything that you're expressing you know, the pain, the anger, and the, and the burden that you're carrying, you know, and just make space for that, you know, um, and to mourn with you <clears throat> as someone who shares similar space, you know. Um, you know, I, I just think that um, we, we really, like, well, I guess going back to this professionalism, you know, it's just like it, it, the professionalism robs us of the space to mourn because mourning isn't professional, you know? Um, and when I say mourn, I mean like I am touching into the pain and I'm giving space for that pain to be there and whatever happens, happens when I touch into that. But I don't, I can no longer bear to have my pain, my brokenheartedness ignored and bypassed. I can't any longer hear people tell me that this is not the time for you to be upset. You know, that for me, that's an act of violence. You know, and it's an act of control as well. You know, because I can control you if I can get you to repress and bypass your emotional reality. 
you know, because as we know, you know, talking about white supremacy, let's talk about patriarchy. Patriarchy is really about rigidity as well. So professionalism is about rigidity. It's about naming things. And for me, patriarchy is about um, categorizing everything, putting everything in its place so everything can be labeled, you know, and, and put in its place. And so we can define everything. And we can predict how everything's going to go only because we just want everything controlled. We don't want any, any, any random variable out there, you know, and that's the violence of patriarchy. It's the labeling, you know, and the forcing you to be in a label that's actually quite binary and dualistic. You're either right or wrong. You're the black or white. You're either up or down. No. I want to see. Here. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no. I was just going to say, you know, that like it's if we really want to get serious about disrupting violence in the workplaces, we have to get serious about fluidity. You know, but fluidity is unprofitable. You know, which brings in capitalism. It's it's funny how all this is related. <laughs> yeah, wow. Funny. You know, funny how it's all deeply intertwined in in economics. And yes. the black body is really yeah. powering the the American economy. Yeah. Um, and that makes me think of even here at Google, right? Look. We're a really engineering-based company. We pride ourselves on that. We pride ourselves on you know doing no evil. Um, and you have a line in the book where you 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 call out your your anger as a data point. Um, mm -hmm. And I was like, wouldn't that be radical if we could really see our emotions of data mm -hmm. and and use that data to make a meaningful difference? Like, how could we transform our company if we started to see like oh, our our employees? Not only their lives matter, but their feelings matter, and the way that they show up in, in spaces matter. Um, yeah. I think that would be a radical shift. Yeah, you know, and that data, anger containing data, really comes from uh, Mother Audre Lloyd and, you know, the uses of anger in her essay, where, you know, she's like, anger is full of data, and that's the doorway, right? It's like, what can I learn from my anger? You know, and, and how different could a work environment be if the company actually really cared about its employees? You know, like if it really cared about the welfare, what would that be like? You know, instead of catering to the most dominant and privileged class, you know, but actually starting from the least privileged group the least recognizing my group and say, okay, what do you all need? Like, how would you recreate this space? Yeah. Be powerful. Yeah. Um, and I think part of what comes up when I hear that is this dissonance that, that I feel at work. Like Google will often, you know, we set our OKRs and we're, we're prioritizing diversity. We're releasing our diversity reports mm -hmm. and we look at what's actually happening and we're not really getting more diverse. We continue to hear the same complaints. Um, and, you know, it, it really makes me angry. And, and I'll speak to a little bit to what has been going on in the past few weeks is um, more people have been waking up, if you will, and seems to be genuinely reflecting and trying to make changes. But even that makes me angry, right? Because it, it makes me feel like all of the pain and the hurt that I felt before now didn't matter, wasn't important. And it makes me think like, you know, what were you doing up until this point? You know, you were, you were just not caring. And that also feels violent. So I feel like, you know, there needs to be some sort of acknowledgement or um, a reckoning, I guess, to create that healing. Because even if we do make incremental changes moving forward, we're still not addressing the way that we've been in the past. And, and that's challenge, that's been challenging for me to sit with. Yeah. yeah. And again, just making space, holding space for what you're sharing, just the woundedness, you know, and the anger, just having space for that. You know, instead of just like, you know, often we share how we're experiencing and it's like, okay, let's just move on. You know, I'm sure you've been like me in these spaces where like I've talked about my emotions and it gets really awkward. 
<laughs> no, because we don't do emotions here. But if I show up, we are doing emotions. So there we go. You know, like, because this is important. This is how I show up as a full person. You know, so honoring that, you know, and also saying that again, reiterating that the people who are holding the power in the space, they won't be really interested in the welfare of others until they get interested in their welfare. And we get interested in welfare when we start actually holding space for our discomfort, our pain, and we start acknowledging it. You know, it doesn't, how can you possibly create an environment, a space that is, that honors the emotional fluidity of its folks when you yourself as a gatekeeper for the space are not doing that work for yourself? You know, like yeah. we can't, we can't walk into the office and just keep shutting off, you know? And, and personally, like I've been in situations where, you know, profession, professional situations, right? Where, you know, I've just been going through a lot of emotional stuff and like, and there's been kind of this feedback where it's like, well, Rod, you don't, you're not responding. You're not, you know, you're sl slow with something. You're not being receptive. You seem like you have an attitude and for me, that's an invitation to let you know what's up. <laughs> you know, like that for me, no matter what the professional situation is, it's like I am, I am experiencing something that I can't actually bypass. And so if you want to stay in a professional relationship with me, then you actually have to recognize that I do not have the capacity to skip over this thing that's coming up for me. And I ask you to offer me space. If you can't offer me space, we can't be in a relationship right now, you know, because I will offer the same space to you. And I do, you know, we can't continue to have these interactions where we're, where we're afraid to really like touch into how we're, we're feeling or how others are feeling, you know, even if it means we slow down, you know, even if it means we get less effective and less efficient, you know, the world is changing, you know, and there, if you don't get into the work of emotional labor, then you're going to be left behind because there's a new world happening. You know, there's a new world about to open up, you know, it's a, a new world is coming because we don't have a choice anymore. Like we have to have a new world, a new way of being, which is returning back to the indigenous, you know, the pre-professional, the pre-colonial, the pre-capitalistic, the pre-patriarchal, returning to the indigenous ancestral community and worldview, which honors relationships, which honors healing and connectivity, you know. Yes, we can still do really important work. We can still have our technology. We can still, you know, have these things that we really love to do, but it's gonna have to be different now because it's about tending to and nourishing ourselves now because we can't continue moving on hurting. And then bringing our hurting into spaces where that hurt is just kind of thrown back in, into our faces. It's like, when I hear that, it makes me think that we almost need to reorder our priorities yes. because the, the framework that, you know, America was created in Google and the, the current culture that we live in now, you know, wasn't created with everyone in mind. It, it doesn't value the, the most oppressed among us. It doesn't, it doesn't, you know, inherently. So it feels like, there, there needs to be a little bit of a transformation and just taking it back to how we started at the beginning. Like, how have you approached mm -hmm. this reordering of priorities? Mm -hmm. And you share a lot in the book, personal stories about how you've done that personal work. And I'd, I'd love if you could speak a little bit on that because mm -hmm. I think you know, mm -hmm. it's nice to understand the system, but how do we get down to business personally? Yeah. We get down to business by creating the plan to return back to the body. 
even if our physical experience is full of trauma, you know, which is okay as well, because that's a lot of our situations, right? But coming back to the body means that like, I first recognize that I have a body. I may not be able to be in my body, but I have to recognize that I am embodied, right? And that's maybe all that someone can do in their life is to recognize the body. But for the rest of us, and this has been the heart of my work, it's actually about coming home deep into the body. You know, like re the 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 re-embodying, you know, coming back, coming back into sensation, coming back into the pain, the woundedness that my physical body holds. You know, as I come deeper into the body, I am actually touching deeper into the earth itself. You know, because we the, the thing about um, colonialism, it was a disconnection from the earth, which meant it was a disconnection from the body, you know, because patriarchy, capitalism, whiteness is all about the mind, it's about the head, you know, it's about doing things that are fundamentally brutal for the body and for the earth, you know, so if you can just separate and disconnect that you can do whatever you want. You can enslave a group of people. You can perpetuate the genocide of another group of people because you want their land. You can marginalize other groups of people, you know, um, for their economic labor. I mean, it's just all kinds of things you can do when you're disconnected from the body. But when you come back to the body, then you are held accountable for the violence that you perpetuate, even if you don't, even if you're not conscious of it, even if for many of us, we're born into systems that maybe are not of our choosing. Okay, but I'm still responsible for the violence of the system, regardless. And we have to take responsibility. You know, as a cisgendered man, I have to take responsibility for patriarchy and to do the work of undoing patriarchy. You know, um, white folks have to take responsibility for the violence of white supremacy. You know. Um, the violence that they're participating in in this life and the violence of their ancestors because their their ancestors fucking cheated the system so they can have what they have now. And you have to take responsibility for it because if it weren't for your ancestors, you wouldn't be where you're at. You know, um, that's hard to hear, but you know what? I do the same work with my ancestors. I take responsibility for the trauma of my ancestors as well. And none of this, none of this is easy, you know. But this is what I've been doing, you know, um, for almost twenty years, you know, even longer, you know, beginning in my teens and activism. I was doing this. I I didn't call it embodiment, but I was doing the work of justice, you know, formally. Um, so I've been really doing this most of my life, you know. Um, but you have to commit to something. You know, and for those of us who occupy dominant positions, dominant intersectionalities in terms of identity, we're not used to struggle. You know, and we have to get used to the struggle. You know, and nothing says struggle like bringing your attention back to the body and taking responsibility for the trauma. You know, it's not supposed to be easy. Or comfortable. Especially, or comfortable, you know, and, and and tech, right? It's like tech and in the tech space, you're you're valued for your mind. It's a lot of brilliant brilliant people in the tech world. Like it's, I mean, it's just like incredibly brilliant STEM folks, right? You know, yeah, you know, STEM has never been my thing. I've been an artist and a poet and a lover and like a religious leader, you know. Um, but I celebrate folks who have that capacity, but that doesn't make you a good human, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. that doesn't make you, being intelligent and brilliant doesn't make you like a good person, you know, like I have fancy, back, mm -hmm. go ahead. It goes back to like, what's valuable right like now in tech we tend to prioritize like oh you know are you into computer science are you an engineer versus like can you connect with someone can you hold space for someone it's um 
you know, supporting the capitalism of the space that we're in. Or can you be uncomfortable with me without running away? You know, which is all I'm looking for, actually. It's like, can you sit with me in this discomfort? And can we just hold the space together? You know, instead of trying to cover it over, trying to 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 manip manipulate, just come back to this really uncomfortable moment, and stop letting this moment tell us that we shouldn't be doing this or that we're wrong, you know, or that this is unprofessional, or that this is too personal. You know, there's no there's there are different ways we connect to each other's humanity. Love is one of those ways, absolutely, but also pain is another way. And the pain is real. Yeah. I think, you know, we've all felt that. Um, and I, I really appreciate you acknowledging that and, and speaking for us out in this book. Um, one thing that comes up as I think about the practices and, and the way that you speak about anger and how it points us to the work that we need to do. Um, it makes me think about mindfulness in tech more generally and some of the more secular mindfulness that is framed as just being, you know, helping us be more productive or calm or, or happy, more efficient. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the way that you frame it is much more radical, but really pointing us in the other direction, you know, you're encouraging us to lean into this comfort, to, hold, to the discomfort, to hold space for other people. Um, so how can we help to stay vigilant, right? Because mm -hmm. you've been doing this work for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, how do we stay open to the anger? And you know, maybe we're not as experienced practitioners right. as you. How do we make space for these, these emotions so that we can navigate mm -hmm. the racial dynamics and our own emotions? Yeah. One of the things that I do, I stay in relationship to the discomfort, you know? And so I'm not necessarily scared of the discomfort anymore, you know? And I, I'm not so afraid of the discomfort because I have been practicing allowing that discomfort to be within a lot of spaciousness. You know, which is the key. This is the key for me, you know, because I, there's, n there's no benefit that can ever happen if there's no mental spaciousness. And mental spaciousness doesn't mean that, like, we get rid of all the material in our mind. And it means that we actually allow everything to be there, you know, and we don't get, we don't have to get so fixated and contracted around certain material in our minds. But when you have the space, when the space opens up, then you're like, okay, there's all this stuff. There's the, the sadness, and then there's the joy. You know, there's the, there's the sorrow, and then there's the, the bliss. Like, it's all happening and mixed up together, you know? Um, so the space for me comes from not reacting. Like, just noticing. I notice, yeah, I feel like shit. Okay, I'm just going to notice it. And if you read the book, yeah, I have so many different practices that helps us to do that, you know? But primarily, the primary practice is the understanding that, like, I don't have to do this alone. Like, I don't just have to sit here and watch the material in my mind and just, like, suffer. But there are sources of refuge. There's the earth, for instance, you know, which is a big part of my practice. Yes, I can actually connect to the earth and ask the earth to hold so much of what I'm experiencing. I don't have to just do this alone. We need support, we need the collective. We need the community. And that's a part of like, you know, colonialism and white supremacy and capitalism is anti-collective. You know, it's, it's anti, um, it's, 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 well, it's, it's pro-individualism, I would say. I would reframe that. All these systems are pro-individualism you know, but not so much about how do we rely on the collective for support, you know, for help, you know. I think one of the toughest things for many of us to say is I need help. You know, I can't do this alone. I need help. 
you know, in Western culture, particularly American culture, it's like that's a statement of weakness, you know, to say that we need help because we should always be self-reliant, you know, which again is anti-Indigenous, anti-ancestral wisdom, you know. Um, so, yeah. We are, we're held accountable by our pain. You know, I never forget yeah. it. My pain yeah. is important for me. We have to allow ourselves to feel it. I think for me, that was one of the biggest realizations. Like, you know, being passive aggressive isn't helpful. But, you know, like just because I can write a really good passive aggressive email, it, I've, I've got to feel it. And I've got to, like you said, reach out to the, you know, develop practices to, to tune into myself, to support myself. Um, I do want to mention that we are going to open it up to audience questions. So if you guys are watching, we'd love, we have about 15, 20 minutes left. We have plenty of time because I see y'all chatting in here. Um, so please drop some questions in and we'll continue this discussion. Um, the, the last thing I'll ask in terms of my formal question, I know in the, our last conversation, you talked a little bit about your, what you're thinking about for your next book, yes. which for me was really exciting. So I'd love if you could just share a little bit, especially if folks aren't familiar with your work and no. are just getting interested. I hope it hasn't changed since we last talked. I forgot what I told you um, about the next But whatever book. comes to mind. Yeah, what, you know, if you work with me, you know that like things change every day. <laughs> um, but, you know, right now for my current writing project, I'm really thinking about how do we practice goodness and virtue in this next, age that's coming about, you know? Like when we get past the pandemic, right? Or when we get to a place where taking it seriously <laughs> or something, we have a vaccine. One of those I think will happen. But like when we get to this place where we can say, okay, I can get like a breather, like what else, you know? And so I'm really thinking about that right now. It's like a guide that actually, like really a no-nonsense, straightforward, deep transformational guide that helps us to cultivate virtue, goodness, you know, a guide that's connected to, to systems of oppression, connected to identity, connected to who and what we are, bringing everything to the path of developing goodness and virtue. Um, how do we become modern, saints, you know, in a way that's not religious or like overly spiritual, but like, how do I just become a good person that takes responsibility for everything and still having fun and experiencing joy, you know, and, and being a part of communities, you know, that's what I'm interested in. So that's what I'm working on now. I love that. It, that that was basically what you shared, and I, I said okay. it last time, I'll say it again. I am so excited for this book because I feel like you really pulled together the theory of like, you know, what is it to be good? And then what does it mean? And in this book, you do this with anger, right? Like, what is anger? You know, wh what is holding space? How is that related to love and acceptance? And then you show us, right? You tell us and then you show us, and I think, um, you know, thinking about goodness and virtue, when we think about the prison abolition movement, yes. those two are directly related, right? Yeah. There, I think when we when we say abolish the police, we're really calling into question, like, mm. how are we defining what is good, what is right, what is a crime, um, who deserves to be in spaces, and I, and I think um, it, it's a really powerful topic. Exactly, you know, and I just, and this is for millennials, 
as well. So it's like actually, and that's a new, I think that's, this is a new thing that's happened since I talked to you last. I think what I've discovered is that like, no, I actually want to write to millennials. And like, I'm in a weird, I'm like an elder millennial. <laughs> like I'm in a weird place because I'm technically at the very, very last second that you can be born into Gen X, you know? Um, but people like, no, that's millennials. Like, no, I don't know. You know, I don't know. Like I'm, a little, I'm, I'm too, I'm slightly too old to be a millennial, but I'm too young to be Gen X. So I'm like, I'm in this gap space right now. Um, so I, I'm coming at it as an elder millennial saying, okay, this is what I've learned um, about this. Yeah. yeah, about goodness. I love that. Um, we have a question from Jan Lyons. Um, I'm just gonna go with her first question. It's what types of meditation practices and body practices help to hold space for all of the emotions for you? And mm -hmm. then the question, I guess there's a follow-up. I find it easy to get fixated and angry at myself to keep putting myself in these environments. Um, mm -hmm. Like when I'm tolerating, mm -hmm. even when I'm fighting, it feels exhausting. Yeah. Need more of all the mixture of that to get validated too. Yeah. yeah. You know, when I'm like, when I'm doing movement practice, you know, and you know, and like you, Andre, I'm a medicine, uh, yoga teacher as well like i don't nearly teach as much as i should like it's like a secret thing that i did <laughs> and now and i like, do yoga yeah yeah i do yoga too but i don't teach it ever um but um for me it's well there's a lot to that question i'm gonna actually answer it from the back end so i want to get into first you know Sometimes we find our spaces, our, ourselves in spaces where we're fighting and we're taking on work that isn't actually our work to do. And, and for me, I've noticed that I get really exhausted trying to do everyone's work. And so I've had to like actually step back, set a boundary and say, you know what, this isn't my work to do. You know, when, you know, white folks are coming to me, they're like, please educate me. And I'm like, I can't actually do that. <laughs> now, you know, I was asked recently to come and talk. Well, I'm actually often asked to come and talk to groups about racism. I'm just like, I just can't right now. I just don't have the emotional capacity to do that, you know? Um, and so putting up those boundaries, you know, sometimes, you know, I have to say, you know what? I can't have this argument, you know? Yeah, maybe this really, this like really violent thing just happened, like a microaggression. You know what? I just don't have the capacity to deal with this right now. And I have to put up a boundary and walk away because it's actually about self-preservation for me. You know? Um, and so getting into the practices, like I have to let go of the ways in which I am forcing myself to do things that I don't have the capacity for. You know, I am no longer mad at myself because I don't have the capacity to have every argument. You know, on social media, people are always posting things and saying, criticizing me and so forth. I learned how to let it go and say, you know what, I'm not, I just, I just don't have it. But you don't even know me, first of all. <laughs> you, know? Um, you don't know me. Like, we're not friends. We don't, like, we're not even associates. We're not, we're not, not you just know me from a few words. I've put out in the world and you've created a huge judgment about who and what I am. I just don't have time to, to deal with that. You know, in terms of my practices, for me, it's like any practice that I'm doing, it's about the space that I'm experiencing in the practice, even if it's asana. You know, I teach asana, I teach a lot of like mindfulness, you know, in asana. Like, you know, I bring people into to postures. I'm like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna be here and I want us to open and settle into this. Even if it is uncomfortable, let's open to this because this is just life. You know, we're always encountering thing, encountering things that we don't want to deal with. Let's practice right now by creating spaciousness around this comfort, you know, even in this asana. And so that's how I practice, you know, bringing all this together and holding, you know, just holding space for everything. It's just like, a really interesting meditation that I teach, which I love, is like imagining that my mind is a vast ocean, 
you know, and just like sitting and watching the vastness of my ocean, of the ocean of my mind. And whatever in my mind, whatever material that feels uncomfortable in my mind, whenever that comes up, I imagine that that material is like flowers. And I imagine just offering, casting these flowers out onto the ocean of my mind and just watching them float out. You know, and if you live by water, like this is a beautiful meditation to go do, just sit by the water and just mingle your mind, your awareness with the water, the ocean, the lake, wherever you, you have, you know. Because um, again, that. it's about self care. And that's going to be, these are meditations that are going to be in the next book, you know, um, as well. That's wonderful. Um, I think we have another question. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the next one. How did you find your anger during meditation? Mm -hmm. How does it feel different to anger pre meditation practice? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I came into, I was very passive aggressive my whole life. I couldn't connect to anger because again, like anger for me was dangerous. Like if I expressed anger, then I would be punished, disproportionately punished. You know, like my anger was, was a mirror for people around me, you know? Um, so I learned at an early age to turn that into passive aggressive anger, you know? So that meant like throwing shade, <laughs> you know, um, you know, which is what we do well in the community, you know, like we do, we do shade really well, you know, of course, shade erupts into reading, right? You know, um, so it was the kindness of mentors early in my practice who would sit me down and say, Rod, you're angry. And I had no idea what they were talking about. You know, and then I started practicing meditation and I started connecting to it. And meditation actually helped me to have the capacity to notice when I was experiencing anger in the moment. And that was the biggest gift, you know, and that was the real learning for me when I could actually say, oh, my God, I'm experiencing anger. <laughs> like, this is it. You know, that was transformative for me. That was liber it was so liberating to say, oh, my God, I'm angry. It's incredible. I haven't bypassed it. I haven't pushed it away. And it, it, it became so exhilarating for me, you know, but I can to, also to hold it. To connect to that. To connect to it. I mean, it's just like, a, it was like being born again. It really was. I know there's a lot of people who are like, I'm always angry. I'm always connected to it. But like, I was never that person, you know? So to reconnect to anger in a way that I could see it, because when I saw it, I could actually like disrupt the ways in which I was reacting to it that created harm for myself and others. You know, that's why it was so transformative. I was like, oh my God, I can be less violent now. You know, and it's not that I don't still throw shade and talk shit and do all of that, you know, because I do. You know, I think we have to intentionally be messy. You know, which I'm going to talk about in the next book. We have to intentionally practice messiness, you know, um, because it's like a, a pressure valve situation. It's like a pressure cooker. Like you need you need a, 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 a valve to release steam in the pressure cooker. You're just going to have something exploding. <laughs> you know, that's how many of us are. We get locked yeah, down like and we explode. But that that valve, that valve, I'm sorry, I'm from the South. So like, like I say things really differently. So I'm, I apologize if you have no idea what I'm saying. The valve, <laughs> is like, I used to take linguistics and I studied linguistics with like professors who weren't from the South and they were just like, they were like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Why can't you pronounce these words? Anyhow, no, we got you. Um, you know, but that 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 release is so important. We can be really skillful about that release. Sometimes I just say really, you know, really, you know, excuse my language, fucked up things, <laughs> you know, yeah. within spaces of people who can hold that, you know, or I listen to things like I listen to like music that's like really quite derogatory, you know, you know. <laughs> Um, but I do those things intentionally because they help me to process 
bits of my anger um, that maybe I can't get to through meditation. Yeah. And just create space for a full self. Yes. Like if, if we're too ta ta ta, you know, that's mm -hmm. going back to the idea of professionalism, like having yes. to be a certain way. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I love and we that. Can, and we can create spaces where we can be flexible and adaptive and forgiving. You know, I can show up as a, as a agent of forgiveness and look like you don't, we won't always get it all right. I think that's another fear that we have. It's like, oh, I can't, I won't talk about certain things because I'll never say the right thing, but you have to. Like you have to start articulating these things because that's how we get feedback, you know, about how things are landing. And we have to do work to create I don't want to say safe spaces, but we have to create spaces that can take care of us as we expose yeah. these parts of ourselves that we need to do work around. Yeah, I like to say supportive spaces. Yeah, supportive. Mm -hmm. At any moment, a, a space can become unsafe, right? Yes. Unintentionally. Um, so yeah, I think we have time for one last question mm -hmm. before we come up on our hour mark. Um, so Arabi has this question, how do you see the role of technology in challenging the violent logics of our system? Yeah. I just, I mean, there's, oh my God, there's so many ways I see technology. Like the basic thing is like, I tell people, listen, we're living in, a, in an age where we have access to boundless media content, <laughs> you know? that like we don't like this isn't like the 80s or like the 90s which we grew up in where it's just like there's no we grew up before the internet so it's like if you wanted to know something you had to roll to the library <laughs> your book open get your encyclopedias out that's right you know like now we can just pick up our phones we have these personal computers now that we can just like, we can ask it any question, we can get these resources. So that's how I see technology being used right now. And then I'm sure they're like, wait, I've, you know, there are apps now that actually work with internalized bias and helps us to uncover these things, you know, which I've used before. And those are really fantastic, but we just have to be willing to use the technology. We have to be willing to, to be educated, you know, right now. Um, so, yeah, the technology is there. You know, we've got to change ourselves. We're the ones building. You know, yeah. Google's building a lot of technology. Yeah, you have to like. There's an ocean of drinkable water, I think. You know, to use that analogy, we have to. We just have to go down to the water and drink it. You know, uh, we just have to just drink. And yeah, it's it's going to be hard. It's hard work, but it's not impossible. There's so many people doing this and they're writing about it. They're, you know, using technology to document the work that they're doing. And we just have to really learn from them. Empower ourselves yes. to go and do it. Um, we're coming up on time. So I just want to say Lamarad, thank you so much for this fruitful conversation, for sharing your wisdom, your knowledge. Um, I want to invite all of you guys watching, whether you're live or you're watching this video, go get Lama Rod's book, Love and Rage, The Path of Liberation Through Anger. It's my favorite book of the year. That has changed my life, hands down. Um, any last words or anything else you want to share? Yeah. I mean, just briefly, I would just say, just please continue to do the work that you can do. You know, anything is helpful. You know, it really is, you know, and just be kind to yourself, be gentle with yourself um, because it's really hard work, but we have to do it. We have to do it. Thank you.